My computer told me it was charging, but it wasn't, and it just lost power, which is terrifying. Or dirty. Yeah. It seems to be powered properly now, but that scared me. Yeah. I have 2% now, apparently. found it online and like you turn it into a notepad. I love it. <coughs> My computer just died. That was fun. My computer just died. <laughs> I, I didn't have it. It wasn't charging. It's alive now. And that speaker is down, right? I'll just hand you the mic. I'm here with Laura Frank live. Actually, um, yeah, so the, I got the first chapter done, which I got the easy one done, yeah. updated the about me section, um, and then now that I can get past getting on board here, I've got to start digging in. I've got a fourth of it due by the end of the show. <coughs> yeah, <laughs> it's funny how those deadlines oh, I know, they, they come on fast, too. I did it to myself. Hello, thanks for joining us. I'm Vicki Claiborne. I'm live in Disguise's office in downtown LA, and I'm joined by the fantastic Laura Frank. Um, this is a little 
pre-interview, pre-event interview, pre -event interview uh, to give you guys, everyone who's online right now watching, a uh, little preview of what we're going to talk about tonight. But I'm not going to really throw too many questions at her other than I'd love to hear, uh, have her share some of her stories from her travels and tell us a little bit about how that led to your book. Thanks, Vicki. I'm really happy to be here. Hi, everyone. Um, so my husband and I left on our trip uh, last year, September 2nd. Um, we had about six weeks planned at that point, and uh, I knew one of the projects while we were traveling was that I was going to be working on this textbook, and I had the deadlines in place, um, but I really wasn't sure where I was going to be working. So uh, our trip, where we ended up, uh, planning out um, places to be close to deadlines so that I had some time to sit down and relax and actually work on this book and do the research. Um, that, that all evolved over the course of the year and it was pretty exciting. But we ended up some really beautiful places where I did some of my un most intensive writing uh, in Budapest, I think was, uh, well, sp in, in the south of Spain in Malaga, I think I wrote the first quarter. And then in um, Mauritius, I wrote a good section of the book. I had some time in Budapest where uh, there was another big section written. So this uh, textbook, when it comes out, is an international labor of love. That's fantastic. So how did you manage to um, find the time while you're on the road and, and, and balancing that work and also what I'm sure was a lot of fun uh, along the way? So, so one of our goals with our trip was to uh, not be tourists, but to kind of find ourselves in a location in a city, like take Bud Budapest, for example. We had an Airbnb for a month and uh, kind of researched the area we were moving into so we knew about local markets and local cafes and kind of just adopted a local working lifestyle. So, you know, a typical day might be get up in the morning, have coffee and some breakfast in our place, um, work for the morning, and then maybe plan an outing after lunch. So, uh, you know, maybe one activity a day. So as opposed to normal travel where you have a week or two to explore, uh, if we have a month in Budapest, spending three days in a row, kind of like only seeking out one museum or one park or tourist activity in the afternoon, you can stretch out a pretty in-depth travel itinerary over the course of the month get a lot of work done and feel like you're still exploring this foreign locale that you're they're working in. And as we were doing this, we realized there are a lot of people out there living this lifestyle. Um, and we started to meet some of these people, which was pretty exciting. And th so the whole digital nomad community, um, it, it's kind of this exciting group. A lot of people do it many different ways, but the, the focus is all of these people are doing some kind of remote work. And for me, writing a textbook was my remote job for the year. And um, it was very easy to get tips and ideas for, for lifestyle choices so that you could work and travel and jo enjoy the best of all of it while on the road. So in your travels, have you, um, uh, in all of the experiences you had, has, has one place stood out to you? Uh, it's such a, a hard question, really, to answer. I mean, most recently we were in China, so that's um, foremost on my mind. Um, but it's it's pretty d exciting to think that this time last year we were walking the Camino de Santiago in Spain, which, you know, for us, we kind of saw that as the uh, transition from our full-time working life to whatever was coming next. Um, yeah, that we we also were just on the Trans-Siberian Railway, um, which we took through Mongolia, um, and then and then I have to think back, like okay, January of this year we were in front of the Great Pyramid, so we've had a pretty incredible year, like being able to see some of the great wonders of the world and um, and thinking ahead about where we're going next. I was going to ask you that question: <laughs> <laughs> what I what's in store for you when you return? Uh, so we're heading back to Asia at the end of October, and we'll start in Hong Kong. But um, the goal now is to slow down. We've done a lot of active travel for the last couple of months, but I think ideally um, we're going to start spending at least a month in each city we go to. So coming up on the itinerary is um, Taipei for November, 
Bangkok for December, Hanoi uh, for probably January and February. We'll do a few little side trips around Southeast Asia from there. And then we want to work our way up to Japan for the cherry blossoms because that's always been a wish list of mine. So uh, uh, changing gears a little bit about your presentation tonight, um, what, what kind of uh, themes or, or topics are you going to be talking about this evening? Well, one of the things um, I have the advantage of right now is, is some time to think about where I want to be with my career in this textbook um, over the coming years. And I feel like this is a real opportunity for me to focus on community and community outreach and growth. Um, we've been working with media servers now for almost 20 years, but we are still sometimes this kind of um, not disorganized but misorganized community on a production where there are disparate groups all part of a video department but it's they're, they're dissected into different little communities and this is a moment i feel like with with all the technologies coming at us and the complexity of some of the shows we work on that we really need to combine as a true video department and include everyone in that from the content creators to the screen engineers so that we can have a more holistic co uh, conversation through production about um, doing all of our work well. So um, I'm hoping to you know, speak to that, be a leader to our clients, to say you know, we need a true leader, leadership figure in the community, and that's why my textbook is called Screens Producing, because I think the screens producer role can really be enriched to be that leadership position and hoping to promote that for the community we all work with. And, and you are a trendsetter in that regard. Um, screens producer is a, is a role that you've had for several years now. Is that correct? Yes. Yep. Um, so some of your projects are actually here on our, on our uh, digital wall. Um, you want to tell us about some of those, yeah. perhaps? Well, some of these I'll be um, also presenting about in, uh, in our discussion of the textbook. But this is a really great event from 2016, um, Black Girls Rock. Um, a set designed by Ann Brahick. Um, content came in from a number of different teams. What else do we have? Um, Turner up front. Um, this is a really fantastic project, one I worked on for um, almost 10 years, uh, you know, coming in as a media server programmer and as the uh, set um, was more and more uh, overtaken by video. As you can see now, the entire set is video surface. Um, and this is from two years ago, that you know my role shifted with it. So from a programming role managing content to then a screens producer role managing a team and taking 15 different content production teams through the process of delivering to such a complex working environment. Um, I think that's what we see here. Yep. Very good. And so your book, which we're going to you're going to tell us about tonight, um, it's scheduled to come out in December. Is that correct? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, and that's with. Uh, tell us a little bit about who it's with and and how people could order that. So um, the the book is with Rutledge, and um, I, if you go to media-operations.com and you'll see the link in the presentation, that will t take you to the page at Rutledge where you can pre-order the book. Uh, I think it should be out by end of November, at least December, and uh, the title is Screens Producing and Media Operations. Well, thank you, Laura. It's been a pleasure to have a little interview before the uh, presentation tonight. So uh, we hope you all will tune back in at 4 o'clock for Laura's presentation. And, uh, and if you happen to think of some questions while you're watching, it could probably reach one of us here at the office, and we'll see if we can get that question in for you. So um, we'll see you around in about uh, 20 minutes or so. Thanks for joining us. Does that work? <laughs> I was like, we don't have a clock. I don't have a clue. <laughs> it's probably just a five-minute interview, isn't it? Oh, no, I'm sure we squeeze ten minutes out of that. Winging it. Okay. All right. Should we check uh, speaker? Okay. And I'll make sure I'm getting power. All right. Check, check. Check, check, one, two, okay.
<laughs> so uh, I introduce uh, Ash. <laughs> can you hear me okay? Yeah, can everyone hear okay? One second, one second. I came to Laura Did Trust ages ago at LDI where she dialed in Spain. Um, so I, I would love to be there and I will be there for the next one. Um, so anyway, I just wanted to introduce Laura to you in case some of you don't know who she is. <laughs> um, first time I met Laura was actually at, I got, we got invited to come see the Latin Grammys backstage when they were rehearsing in Vegas. Uh, I don't know if you remember that. <laughs> I remember it well. Um, and all hell was breaking loose on stage. I think they were trying to like put some LED up while Pitbull was rehearsing, and there was a whole bunch of dancers and ponies or something going on. I don't remember what, exactly what it was, um, but it was mental. And the main thing I remember was standing behind Laura while she was sitting at her, her, her other her system. <laughs> and, um, and the thing that I remember most was Laura was completely calm and in control, and every now and then she'd kind of reach out and touch a button and say something into her mic, but it was like she was, you know, having a day by the beach, she was so chill, and I just remember thinking, my ambition in life is for our stuff to be as good, so good that she wants to use it one day, that was kind of my, my, my ambition, and then a few years later, we actually did get to do that, <laughs> and so we worked together in, um, uh, in Miami on a wonderful show called Premio Juventus, where they, I think they rehearsed like 25 acts in one day. Um, okay, maybe two acts. days, but yes. And that was, I think, one of the first big sock puppet shows that we did, and uh, we had all kinds of issues with media not showing up on the right thing at the right time, and all kinds of stuff. And um, so I think even Laura would agree it was not the easiest of shows. But I was, I was calm, right? I was still. Yeah, I know, it was <laughs> um, but but the thing of, the thing about that show was that Laura was just so incredibly patient and protective of us, when she had every right to be really pissed at us, and we've sort of been friends ever since. Um, and it's been absolutely amazing. Uh, so there's a very small number of people in one's career who uh, you know, take the chance on you and are generous enough to help you up to the next level. And uh, Laura's been that person for us, and I think definitely for many of you out there. Um, so when we first met, um, I, I nicknamed Laura the Duke. And everyone was <laughs> like, hang on, you can't call her the Duke, she's the Duchess. And I was like, no, because the Duchess is, you know, have tea parties and stuff, but, uh, but Duke's own stuff. And that <laughs> thing I remember, I've never ever seen anybody own a stage the way that Laura owns it. Um, I mean, she literally wrote the book on how, how to manage this crazy process that we go through uh, when we make shows and bring some sort of sanity to it. So I think it's absolutely fitting that she's actually written a real book because we all, we all just look to her, um, you know, to get some understanding into, into all this. So if anybody has an insight, I think, into the future of the industry and, and how we're going to work um, 20 years from now, including going on holiday forever and, and uh, <laughs> and finding everything in from the beach. Um, it's Laura, so um, I'm hugely honored that you're letting us be part of your launch, Laura. Um, thank you so much, and um, have a great evening, everyone. I wish I could be there. Thank you, Ash. It means a lot. Yep. <laughs> Bye, dude. All right, that's the way you start a show. Um, so, hello everyone, I really appreciate you all coming out for this. Um, as Ash mentioned, uh, part of my reason for presenting today is I have a book coming out. Um, what I think is the first book about workflow directed at our industry um, for producing content for multi-screen live events, operations, and um, communicating about engineering. So with that in mind, um, just a little about me. Uh, I've been in the entertainment industry now for quite a while. Uh, my company, Luminous Effects, I founded in um, late 99, 2000, uh, kind of preparing for what I saw with the advent of um, the Icon M project from light and sound design. Um, in the, the media server market was evolving and there was talk of digital lighting and I wanted to be a part of that community moving away from lighting programming and lighting design into what became the media server and pro, uh, media server programming community. Um, so at that time I founded my company Luminous Effects and uh, have made the transition from lighting to video since that time. Um, and and on to the future. Um, but currently my future looks like this. Um, 
<laughs> Some of you may know uh, my husband and I have shifted into a digital nomad lifestyle. Uh, we left September of last year and had about six weeks planned and over the last, the course of the last 13 months have done that, which has been pretty amazing. But while doing that, I was also in the middle of writing this book, which is gonna come out at the end of November, uh, December. Um, screens producing and media operations, um, taking full ownership of the fact that our community um, and you know, sitting around a media server and the team that it takes to get this work done doesn't really even have a standard team structure, core, or name. So I've just adopted some for us. I hope you like them. Um, titled the book, Advanced Practice for Media Server and Video Content Preparation. And the focus of this book is, um, is about who we are and how we achieve the work that needs to happen and the teams we need to be able to communicate with to do that effectively. Um, you know, uh, we're a very different beast from now than what we were at the start of media servers 20 years ago. So I just want to take a look at that a little bit. Um, yes, so you can find more about this uh, at media-operations.com. We'll at least take you to the link uh, for Rutledge um, for the book so you can find out about the pre-launch. Um, so coming to the point where I could write this book, uh, th this is kind of a midway point in my career with media servers, 2010, on the Latin Grammy Awards for Univision. Um, this was my typical setup, surrounded by uh, laptops, Grand MA console, media server screens, managing um, the content production workflow while programming and maybe working with one engineer uh, while this is all happening. Um, so, you know, I, li I like this picture a, a lot because this to me was a real critical point where um, after the economic slowdown of 2008, 2009, video screens started to dominate scenic design again uh, for television production, whereas during that period, uh, eight, 2008, 2009, I almost had to entirely move back into lighting programming after building up pretty steady work in the media server market. Um, so th this to me is the real shifting point where I could rely on media server work full time, but at the same time, it's also a reminder of a place I never want to go back to, where it's one person managing all this information flow uh, with no support. I learned a great deal during this time and built a workflow so that one person could manage all this um, work and um, information and you know, the files that need to get managed and knowing where they were <laughs> at all, all times. But, it, so that was important, but at the same time, this is what we need to move past our shows where this occurs, and that's what the book tries to do. But first we have to at least get to this point where shows are dominated by video, we have the tools to manage that. Um, but it's important to remember where we came from. And to me, that was the world of low-res LED, Catalyst and uh, early Mbox systems. Um, you know, this world of digital lighting. Since I came from lighting design and lighting programming, I had really great relationships with a lot of uh, television lighting designers and could easily step into this market. And it usually meant me, maybe one or two um, signal paths coming out of a media server, managing digital lighting with a catalog of Arts Beats footage. And it was up to me to make this stuff <laughs> look interesting, um, which was kind of a fun challenge. And because that was the role I occupied in the lighting programming world, where you know we are left to audition looks and 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 lighting cues and um, chases to a lighting designer. I just slipped into that role with media, working still in the lighting team to turn this into um, interesting work. Again, my company, founded in 99, with that focus on um, scenic media and, and using video as a scenic painting tool and targeting that market. So those early years um, involved some really great projects. Uh, in the center at the top, the Holiday Light Show 2002, 
was a great project um, with a Catalyst Moving Head server where we painted the ceiling of Grand Central Station in New York. Um, Creative Time curated several artists to design pieces. And it was the first time that I was having conversations with um, uh, media artists about thinking outside of raster space. They had the entire surface of the Grand Central uh, Station ceiling to create content for, and we could move it around for them and, and use that space. Um, David Bowie's last tour in 2003, a reality tour, uh, one of the, the greatest mentors for me about how to use video as scenery. Uh, when we were building this tour and realized you know, that we wanted to invest visually in all this space um, with video screens, um, you know, he said to me, as long as, you know, I, if, I don't care if we use these screens for three songs out of the entire three hour set. If the upstage is the band or the music, we failed. And that's always been kind of my guiding principle, is the screens are supposed to support a theatrical experience, not dominate. Um, so I think that's really important to me and, and my, the way I would think about my role as screens producer in a live event is knowing that we had to support the process and not overwhelm. Um, Shrek the Musical, um, we had a lot of great video surfaces and projectors and that, and then of course you can see examples, uh, you know, I think I worked for two solid years on VersaTube projects easily. So that, that was development time, establishing myself as a media server programmer. And then as I was saying, 2010 and on, as these scenic environments became so video intensive, I consider these the workflow development years. Um, as one individual representing all this visual real estate, trying to support multiple content teams to achieve their goals, I needed a clear way to represent the set to these teams, to make them feel confident that their creative vision was going to be realized, and to effectively program the show as quickly as possible. So 20, 10 to 2016 or so, that's really where I started to establish what this workflow was gonna look like. Um, after that time period where I realized, okay, now the scale of this stuff is just overwhelming. It's ridiculous for one person to own this much um, and, and be responsible for so much. I consider these team development years where I made the choice to step away from the programming role, um, promote myself as a screens producer, and then build a team and understand the roles that that team needed to occupy to do this effectively. Um, what's unique about my market compared to some other markets, say for um, live touring or corporate events, um, there's not one single show that I work on or have worked on where there's only one content team. Um, these shows need to function with multiple content teams delivering with short rehearsal windows. So. In, in this period, um, the team we built was really about programming speed. So we needed clear, reliable, repeatable delivery workflow instructions that content teams could understand, that were clear, that could get us content that we then understand how, to, how it was gonna be used in a show environment so that we could get this stuff programmed as quickly as possible. Um, in a television re rehearsal window, if lighting and um, camera, they have an hour and a half maybe to rehearse with a, a performer or a band. Um, we are the scenery at this point with all this visual real estate. If, if they're waiting for me to program the looks or my team to program the looks while they're trying to learn what the lighting should look like and the, where the camera should be, we're, n we're not helping that process. So my feeling always was at the top of any rehearsal window, this should programming should be done. So I needed a way to make sure this was clear and um, complete before we're even working on lighting and camera with the rest of the live production team. So out of all this experience, I tried to distill all this in the book. Um, and the goals of this book are to define what a screens producer does and what the media operations team does differentiate what we do from theater and from projection design, because I think uh, outs theater is, is not a unique case, but it's a special case, and, and 
the role of the production designer does not always apply to what we do in other live events. Um, in the book, I wanted to outline my particular brand of a content production workflow. Um, also give uh, structure and um, promote the, uh, our relationship with the production team that we as a screens producing and media operations team, um, who we are and where we live within the production community. Um, this book is also set up to create community amongst ourselves and the various different aspects of live event production that we work on as representatives of the video team. And then really to set us up to pre prepare for how um, mixed reality is going to impact uh, what we do as best I can. Um, this is the chapter structure of the book. Uh, you can also find this online. But um, takes you a little bit through practice and principles, history, and then the middle section of the book is really about workflow. Um, and then I save some room at the end to talk about previs, future of media operations, and, um, and then gave some space to the community. Uh, several people contributed essays to talk about the way they perceive this work. So, who does this workflow serve? Um, let's talk about who the video department is. Right now, I think there are three major primary groups. Content creation, media operations, and that would include the server programmer role, and screens engineering. So when someone, like if you're working for a client or um, someone on another part of the production team, they might refer to video and mean one aspect of this. And I think it's you know, far too often that we're in a situation that this is not a cohesive group. So it's not even just the, those three groups. Video is branching out and represents a lot more than just these three teams. You have the camera department, scenic LED, um, real-time content production. Sometimes performers bring in their own media server gear, the broadcast truck. AR is on more and more production, live event productions. This is all video, and yet I, I, we've all been in situations where a producer might hire one piece of this team and not relate them to the fact that all these people need to be working together to really see a show be successful. And that's, to me, something I want to solve. So I think of video in this structure, that screens producing should sit in relationship to these three entities and drive the communication between those teams to be successful. So in my particular team as a screens producer, I sat within the media operations department, but considered it my responsibility to be that partner to content creation and screens engineering so that everyone felt that their role was valued, their needs were heard, and that they would be supported in their process. And to me, that support is in the raster structure that we built. So for the content team, um, when we talk about templates, and I'm sure we all have our own version of templating for a show, the content team, there's a design raster for them. For media operations, there's a delivery raster. And for screens engineering, there's a signal raster. The core of the workflow that the book talks about is explaining these three rasters, how they support these three teams, and um, you know, the tools you need to produce these uh, templates efficiently and to serve the goals of each of these different teams. So starting with the design raster is where I usually begin. That then through usually an After Effects template project becomes the delivery raster. And then the media server is what generates the signal rasters. So screens producing, sitting at the center of that, building out, feeding, supporting these teams by creating a structured workflow around a three template system. And this is the type of workflow that my shows have been built on for the last few years. So within that, my ultimate goal is that that screens producing role is one of the top tier production roles with lighting design and scenic design. 
Um, it rarely happens, but I feel like if a production has hired these two design roles, the next phone call should be the screen's producer, especially as scenic design is so heavily um, video driven. And the next step being mixed reality that it's our video teams that are gonna be creating those scenic environments and lighting them internally we need to create a strong dialogue with these two design roles so that we can then incorporate them back into that process. So live lighting and virtual lighting all work together and that scenic design, virtual, physical, all relate to each other. So I think this is the critical piece um, that we are partnered with the scenic designers and lighting designers that we work with regularly so that they get to the point they're not comfortable unless they know who's sitting in this role so that production runs forward and runs smoothly. So just a little bit to talk about how I also want to differentiate from projection design. Um, there was a really great article in the LA Times the other day, um, several projection designers talking about uh, theatrical events on tour um, and you know the relationship of projection design to story. Um, what I love about projection design is you're talking about a group of uh, design professionals who are really taught about space. And so many times um, we work with content teams that uh, they've learned to design for screen and we as live event production professionals get the opportunity to teach them about space. And I've been through this several times as I get to work with different content teams, especially on um, upfront events where you have a lot of broadcast professionals, motion gra graphic professionals from the broadcast world. Um, to me, that's always been a big missing piece is, is training people to understand what scenic media means as true scenic design. And projection design, I think, knows that very well. And that's something we can learn from them. But where it doesn't relate to our part of the industry is um, a projection designer will own the whole pipeline between content creation and operations, whereas it fractures in live event when we have to support multiple content teams and be that, that bridge and support to helping them understand space and um, that element of scenic design where scenic media plays a part. So that's just a little side for, the, for uh, projection design. So screens producing, what's the ultimate goal of the screens producer and the media operations team? And in the book, I describe it in one sentence. Display the desired content to screen at the correct moment in time. So if we go back to this triangle, these are our three teams again. The desired content from the content creation team, display to screen, that's our screens engineering team, correct moment in time, that's media operations. And how do we do that? What does the workflow look like? Well, I broke it down like that. <laughs> so um, that's what we're gonna do now. We're gonna step through this. Using uh, a show from 2018, the iHeartRadio Music Awards. So step one, the first piece of information you typically get about a show will be some scenic renderings. So these initial drawings will give you some information about what's happening. Maybe you get an idea of where the screens are. Um, already when I see these renderings, I'm you know, highlighting, okay, maybe there's some linear LED in the floor. It looks like that piece at the top is some kind of closed down screen. So you know, do I need to be prepared for some kind of automated content to manage location of that screen? Um, I'm already forming in my mind like how many signals I think this show might require. But, you know, there's a lot of information here um, to start a discussion, but I can't really take any actions yet. This is just an, an initial review that I will start talking to the scenic designer about how those screens intend to be used, as well as with the show producers. And those discussions might be, you know, um, is there package content that needs to land on one of these screens? Is there iMag that needs to land on one of these screens? Um, 
for the different performers coming in, is anyone else bringing extra screens? What, what are the creative goals for both the set designer and um, the show producers, creative producers, for this visual environment? Because that's gonna inform how I template out a system. So with that in mind, um, I might start a conversation with uh, gear providers for the media server system. You know, there's a basic outline package that that I start with, so I at least need to put it on hold and put a team on hold. But what I'm really waiting for now is the actual technical drawings so that I understand what the set is going to be. So once these are in hand, I can actually start um, building the workflow. Um, I need to build a team budget. Uh, that includes all my team members. That'll include the initial estimate from um, the media server gear provider. Uh, it's also important to consider prep time with all of this. Um, I've never really come up with a good formula for estimating prep time. I tried to attach it to the number of signals coming off a media server, but it's, um, it's one of those things you learn how to feel out. Uh, next step, I'm waiting for all the technical drawings to be locked. And that way, I'm gonna start mocking, marking up all the, the 2D reference drawing that all the surfaces are clearly labeled so I can speak um, clearly and reference all these different screen surfaces with the screen engineering team and with the content team. Um, this will also include a 3D model in, in the final set of drawings. Usually it comes to me in Vectorworks, which I then convert to Cinema 4D, which has been my preferred tool of choice, to then um, start doing an inventory of what the screens are made of, resolutions, um, yeah. Okay. So in the process of um, moving this to, to Cinema 4D, what matters to me now is that um, I'm going to eliminate in the 3D model all the unnecessary uh, vertices and polygons that are gonna weigh this model down for size. So I'm trying to come up with a model that is streamlined because as you'll see later in the workflow, this model is gonna be used in many different tools. So I, I would personally spend 10 to 20 hours doing this to optimize it and UV map it with my content delivery file. Um, while I'm doing this, I'm comparing the 3D drawing to the shop drawings. Sometimes there are discrepancies between the two. Like I might find a screen in the model that wasn't represented in the shop drawings because it already exists at the theater or, or something like that. So, you know, I step through very carefully to try and understand that what's displayed um, in the technical drawings matches the model and then bring up any issues with the set designer. And that all becomes um, documented in a screens log and um, this is a document that I rarely share in the workflow, but it's kind of m my secret sauce because while I'm outlining all the, the screens and the resolutions, what I'm also trying to come up with is a single pixel density that I'm gonna use to describe all these screens to the content teams. And that pixel density is, is a calculation that I then run through all the screens so that the screens are only represented to the content teams by their physical size, not their output capabilities. Um, in the design process, um, I try and eliminate any of those technical concerns and focus on the, the visual uh, set itself so that all the numbers in the design documentation are represented by the physical size of the screen which is then described to the content team in a design raster. So from all those drawings, from the 3D model, the next goal is to unwrap that screen information into one document at one single pixel density to describe all the screen surfaces. Um, I'll note on all the screens what the physical capabilities or the technical capabilities are of each screen for reference so um, someone might see that if, if a screen is uh, eight pixels per inch and the screen next to it is two pixels per inch, that other screen might not be good for text or fine detail, but for design, everything is represented just by s 
physical size of that scenic unit. Um, for a design raster like that, because there was so much negative space around that floor, I might offer sub-design rasters. But again, these documents are based on this one pixel density across all the surfaces. So any, anything drawn on one surface that is reflected at the same scale on another surface will result in the sales, same scale imagery once um, projected or broadcast to the set. These files are the content creator working space. And through the After, After Effects project I supply, it then gets converted into the delivery rasters. And this is where you see the actual difference in technical capabilities of the screen surfaces. The goal of the delivery raster is to make the media operations and programming side of the process as efficient as possible. So you'll see all the negative spaces removed um, all the screens are, are moved together so that uh, rendering time is hopefully improved in this process. And um, I know we all spent a lot of years looking for ways to manage, um, you know, file management with multiple deliveries and a lot of information. Having every, all the screens delivered on one raster means that file management becomes a lot simpler. I'm only looking for one file, one file name to, to paint the entire scenic environment with content. So um, this is designed to serve the operations team and uh, make the content delivery pipeline as efficient as possible. Because remember, when a file comes in, it might be delivered over the web. Um, it'll probably hit multiple hard drives and get uh, reviewed before it gets onto a media server. So having as compact a file as possible um, helps the whole process and saves us time. Um, but we also, want to be concerned with more than just time, we want to have some creative flexibility. So within the workflow, there are always sub-delivery rasters. So if um, only one piece of the screen assembly needs to get updated, or um, we want to layer different files together, there is a option in the workflow to just add more information to one of the screen surfaces. So in this case, there was a single file for delivery to paint the entire set, and then four sub-deliveries for um, flexibility. Uh, in this process, I will also start drafting the signal rasters, because in the background, I am also working on budget and engineering with the uh, media server engineers, as well as our screen engineers. So we need some kind of documentation to generally outline what the signal flow will look like coming from the media server, um, which will impact the server engineering system and budget and um, start the conversation with the screens engineering team, how this is all gonna get mapped to all the surfaces and how much processing and gear they're gonna need to manage. So um, I usually would start this process as a draft, send this on to the server engineer and um, uh, the server rental company to review for for the system needs and then onto the lead screen engineer so they could see what we were looking at and they could help me optimize this for their engineering needs um, to make this as efficient for them as possible. So at this point, we're getting close to where we can lock down um, the gear budget. Along with gear, I need to lock down my budget with the producers. This includes making sure my team has work for hire contracts and that I have a contract with the show. I'm sure we've done all done shows on handshakes, but I do recommend if you don't have a simple work for hire agreement in your arsenal that, that you get one. Um, okay, next step, as the budget's locked down, um, the uh, art director in the scenic department and the uh, lead screens engineer, everyone's agreed that we are all working towards the same system size. At this point, I've usually sent out a list of screens and tiles and projectors, and we've all clarified we know what the system is and how many signals it's gonna be. Then I finalize the rasters, and for me, that means just putting uh, detailed grid information on all the surfaces so that when we get on site, this is usually the first thing we're broadcasting out of the media server for the engineers so that they can get everything mapped for us, and in the background, we're starting to ingest content, hopefully, once we're on site. 
Um, so I'm finalizing rasters. Then once I have those final rasters, I can UV map my Cinema 4D model. Um, once I have this map model, I include it with the uh, content delivery workflow for the team so that they have a reference tool if they'd like to use it for um, previs. Um, it's, it's an interesting tool set because to me, I, I mean, I don't use the Cinema 4D model much beyond this. I make it available, but the model itself gets used in, in my After Effects project online in, um, in any kind of web model tool and um, is the basis for my uh, disguise project model. Um, in every workflow, I have an After Effects project. This is usually one of the last tool sets I built. Uh, the primary point of the project is to take the content team through the design raster and quickly have a pipeline for them to deliver the, de to render the delivery files that I want. Um, the naming structure is kind of built into this process uh, and there's also a previs tool built in to this process, which we'll look at later. Um, so once the workflow and all its tool sets are built, I then need to share it. Um, and I'm sure everyone's worked with different programming or operations teams. Everyone has their own style of displaying this data. Uh, I build a simple WordPress site, or that's been my tool of choice over the last few years, uh, to outline what all this information is and how to use it. So. Um, once all that information is available, it's time to publish the spec to the team. So I'm handing them files via Dropbox. I've got schedules on Google Drive. I'm using WordPress, Adobe products. These are all the tools I need to publish that spec and get it out to the different users. Um, and then it's time for team review. Um, if it's a new content team, I will walk them through that content delivery workflow online. Um, it, if we haven't worked together yet, so they understand like where all the, all the tools are, how they're intended to be used. Um, so I make sure I'm on the phone with, with any new content team. Um, people who know my workflow and we've worked together before, you know, I leave it up to them to come back to me with questions that things aren't clear. Uh, next step is I'm usually building a starter disguise show file. So again, that Cinema 4D model gets converted to OBJs, brought in, pre-building um, maps or feed maps for um, signal output and to receive our template information and map it to the set. Um, and also because I'm a Sock Puppet user, uh, I'll start outlining our layer structure. Uh, so that all that information is handed to the content, content teams typically about four weeks out before rehearsal. Um, again, with teams I'm not familiar with, I'll ask them to send me test content um, just so that we can, you know, prove that everyone's understood the workflow and that um, files are coming in properly. Uh, I'll be checking for basic things, raster size, codec, frame rate, file naming, the images are landing where screens are. Um, I'll also look creatively at the animation speed that it does not upstaging the talent or activity around head height that might be distracting in a close up. And I'm looking at the color range or level variation in the content to make sure, since I'm in broadcast, that it's going to read nicely on camera. Um, and the last step is uh, typically about deadlines and keeping everyone on task with regular reminders and regular points of communication where we are in the process. So I mentioned a little bit earlier, um, if I'm on a broadcast event and our rehearsals start three days out before a live show, then I'm gonna wanna get the content delivery workflow to the content teams about four weeks before delivery at minimum. That tends to be my target. If I can't meet that target, at times I have put out a draft workflow, so what we assume to be the workflow process is available and there's still some refinements to be made on screens um, and other technical details. So I'll tell people to expect some kind of update. But this is the structure I, I aim for. Some shows need a uh, content workflow much earlier than that. So we just went through all that. Well done. <laughs> um, so let's 
take a look at what that content delivery workflow documentation looks like online in a little more detail. So we'll switch shows. This is uh, 2018 VMAs. So this is the, the home page of the spec site um, where there's going to be a revision list at the bottom, information about you know, what types of tools are where on the website, and basic navigation. And the navigation is structured like how you would move through the show. We start with the most important information, who the team is, introduce ourselves and our roles, let the, the content teams know how to contact us, do a system overview, and then get into the context spec, content spec and uh, what the tools actually are. So in that system overview, we saw an example of this earlier, but I'm going to outline all the technical data about the screens and what we're calling them. So the show structure in its most basic form is, is understood. I'm going to have a page detailing the content specification, basics about codec frame rate, um, if there will be time code, how to deliver still images, and what our previs workflow is going to be. Um, there's also always a page about naming conventions. Naming convention. I'm sure we've all been on shows where a misnamed file has like stalled rehearsal unnecessarily because um, either the file's misnamed or misplaced or the wrong version's being used. Um, we're very strict about file naming. Um, but we're also not going to let it stop a rehearsal process if we can communicate with the content team and understand which file is supposed to be played when. So, if a file, you know, we all understand we're all under pressure. So, if a file comes in misnamed, we'll log that information and keep, you know, notes about how we're using the tools that come to us. I adopted a naming convention with versioning, a little detail about how it's supposed to be used, and um, a tag that tells me what delivery format's being used so I know how to map it within the playback system. Because um, often this is the only communication point an operations team is going to have on site if they're receiving files somewhat in the blind from a content team. So we try and create a way for this to be as information rich as possible so we can do our part of the job. Um, I have a page outlining the different raster types we've been talking about. Um, just if, if this workflow is new to people that they understand what these, how these tools are designed to help them in their process and the content design. And then I'll display on the web page, these won't be to scale, but the different rasters and technical information about those rasters. So we have the design raster, we come to the delivery raster. Again, in these two shows, you can see these are vastly different. This is designed to best represent the set in a visual layout so it feels like creative working space. And the delivery raster rescales, resizes, repositions to make this more efficient for delivery and programming. Um, there's a page outlining, outlining the raster list so teams can understand the various options and the way they can deliver to us. Uh, there's a page outlining the um, After Effects project and where they can find the different tools within the After Effects project, including an explanation of the previs comp inside After Effects. Um, I use a plugin called Element 3D. Uh, there's also the Cineware plugin, but it's a great way to bring the model into After Effects because one of my <laughs> pet projects for a couple of years was trying to solve a uh, pre render previs solution so people could really start feeling that sense of space while designing because I thought that was really important for content teams to always have that 3D reference. So the previs comp is delivered with cameras that emulate basic cameras that you would find in a broadcast production. So you can check a close up, high wide shot while you're building your content. There'll be a page explaining the Cinema 4D file. And then a page using the web model. Um, to embed this within WordPress, I'm using Sketchfab here, but there are other tools available. Um, and just to take a quick look at that. Okay, no more ash, but. So 
So I'm in the Chrome web browser. Sketchfab looks really great on your phone as well. So if you're sending this to a producer or someone um, who just needs a quick reference of what the environment looks like, this is why I love this tool. It's really streamlined and, and simple. But you know, I'm, I'm looking for any ways to get 3D in front of um, creative decision makers, like producers, so that they make a more informed decision about um, the creative as well. And then towards the end of the spec site is all the technical details about the media server system itself, including the final signal rasters. I also include a page about team tech, um, just outlining all of our gear needs. So this is located uh, within the spec site, so this can be sent to technical managers and other engineers on a production to identify how much space we take up and, and what our network needs are, including our internet needs. So that, that's the structure of this book. Um, so I, I spend quite a few chapters breaking that down a couple of times because every show's different. We all have a different process. But I think this workflow and the, the three raster structure is flexible enough that it can be um, modified for most any team's need. Um, it's worked really well in an environment where we need to be fast. And we try and give it creative flexibility with the sub-delivery rasters so that we can um, be flexible on site and not always have to go back to a content team if things need to be changed. We are set up to make changes within the media server to content um, while we're in rehearsal. But ultimately, um, this, this workflow is largely for speed. So a, a couple of other things in, in the book that I talk about are the different types of previs tools that I use, because previs is very important to me. I, as we were talking about earlier, I think finding ways to give people that light bulb moment who mostly exist on screens about how to think about space can be done in a 3D environment. And that is both for content creators and the people who have to improve content design for the show. Because I just got to a point where hearing a producer say on site, well, I didn't know it was going to look like that. that. That should never happen. It's, it's, there are too many tools available to us to to be able to experience this before we're on site together. And um, the time savings is critical. So there's Cinema 4D. You can um, bake a previous experience of a 3D model to show off content. Um, there's the uh, Element 3D or Cineware solution within After Effects. Um, I've had teams render out that comp as well to um, share content with producers. Uh, there's web previs. We looked at Sketchfab. There's also previs.co, Mapping Matter, which is a projector uh, luminance tool. Um, these tools, uh, previs, will allow you to build um, full sequences online that you can share with your team for approval. And then um, what I get really excited about are VR previs opportunities. Like uh, I've done one project with Disguise where I sat with a content team and had a VR rig set up. Um, none of these tools handle scale. I mean, you get a great experience of space, but I don't think you really understand how the content's going to feel for scale until you're in VR or in the room. So um, it was really exciting to see people respond to content production after building out um, Disguise VR and showing content teams how it was going to feel. And then uh, L8, formerly Light Converse, um, where we incorporated lighting. Obviously, with Evo now, hopefully, we'll be able to uh, do Disguise VR with lighting complement <laughs> as well. Um, but that, to me, is, is what I find a really rich experience for Previs. All these are specialty tools and, uh, you know, of course, take people's time and budget to accomplish, which I think is one of the more difficult things to, um, to get budget for. But we started having real success. Uh, you know, people get very excited about it and then shows come around next time and they, they want to get rid of that line item. But I'm, I'm hopeful always about a previs. Um, and then the end of the book, trying to guesstimate the future. Uh, 
Obviously, we have a lot of exciting tools that we're using now, but this is what we're doing now. Um, this is all cutting edge stuff, and I think we should all be thinking forward and learning about these tools so that we're prepared to use them. But Okay, we're in agreement. Um, but again, th th this is what exists now. We have this uh, as our tool set. So yes, I think we should be preparing for mixed reality and real-time content, but to me the future is dependent on some kind of 3D expertise or having someone on your team with that expertise to be able to communicate all this stuff well and communicate with other teams in the video ecosphere that are bringing this to a production that we're building our relationships with scenic and lighting because there is going to be more crossover as those creative teams come into our virtual space and want to impact what we as a video team are providing, um, especially when it comes to the mixed reality experience. And that these are all constant learning opportunities and I think that's what's most important as we keep evolving, we keep changing and it's important for us as a community to recognize how much we impact each other and work together. And um, that's my goal for the screens producer role is to make sure that production recognizes that we as a team have someone who is going to be that caretaker and leadership to make sure everyone has the tools, time, and um, production budget they need to get this done. So that's what I do. There you go. I think we have time for questions. Vicki's going to help me with the microphone if anyone's interested in discussing any topics further. Okay. Yeah. We'll get this uh, question and answer session started with one that came in online while you were speaking from Tiffany. Uh, is it necess necessary to know lighting design to become a screens producer? I think it's... Um, what I would recommend, um, I'm, I'm a big fan of theatrical design education, whether it's scenic, lighting, um, or in, in projection design. I, I don't think it's required, but I think the missing piece is, is awareness of space, as we were discussing. So, um, no, I don't think it's a requirement, but I think it's, it's a richer experience, I would say. All right, questions from the audience? Don't everybody. Oh, if you don't mind coming over to join me here. Uh, you said obviously that the uh, workflow uh, works on the small and large scale projects. What's the biggest difference that you find in the workflow and how the form of it takes for a smaller project versus you know the really large projects that you've got here? Yes, certainly for smaller projects, someone's going to end up wearing more hats than, than I would like. Um, I think a really good example, and I talk this through in the textbook, is if I have a show with a single screen, um, one programmer, screens producer, manager could probably handle that fine. But if the expectation is I'm going to write 400 cues and have um, four teams delivering content to that screen, then you have to you have to understand the complexity of the screen assembly, the queue demand, and the amount of time available. And I think that has to determine team size. So there's there's multiple factors that I think should impact that choice. So it might be a small rig, but a very complex programming job. In which case, I would recommend you know in discussion with the creative producers and understanding the goals of the show that that team be more than one person. And for the reasons that someone programming with an engineer managing that much content information needs some kind of support. So smaller shows, smaller teams, I'm pretty immersed in some very big shows and keep trying to build out my teams to be larger. But um, yeah, I think there is still a place where you can have those, the, a single person managing a lot of information depending on the goals of the queue structure. Does that kind of answer your question? Okay, um, let me get that over here to you. We have one more question online. I'll go to after this gentleman. 
What would be the difference in producing for, let's say, an iHeartRadio show and an eSports show, for example, like Fortnite? Right. I don't know a lot about those shows, but my expectation is there's a lot more engineering infrastructure to manage multiple signal feeds and the destinations they're going to screen. So we see that a lot in some of the um, shows we've worked on more recently where we have such large expanses of screen real estate and so many guest signals or um, live input signals that need to get managed that uh, one of the roles that we're cultivating is like an Encore or a Spider programmer in, in our team structure so that all the signals are coming to one convergence point and we're able to manage that switching within the media operations team rather than a more traditional paradigm of the last few years where everything went to a broadcast truck. So we're trying to take ownership of that switching and all that signal management now. Yeah. All right, and this question is from Cole Marcus. It's, is going to college beneficial for this type of industry or is, is experience the more valued skill? I definitely say go for both. Where, what you're going to get in a college environment is a um, deep, uh, historically rich in tradition experience of a des theatrical design education and the discipline that comes with it. Um, I, I refer to this link a lot. I can find it online, but it's a great essay on, on someone writing about how a theatrical education is the best degree for life because you learn project management, you learn how to live on a budget, you learn how to collaborate, work with a team. So uh, yes, I definitely recommend any kind of college experience, but a theatrical, traditional theatrical education will not steer you wrong. Might be some older tools that you're working with while you're there, depending on the school, but it's, it's worth it. And uh, Rod sent a comment that we're all hopeful about previs. <laughs> Uh, uh, yes, okay. Let me get to the back here. What is the um, biggest bottleneck in your workflow at the moment? Next time we get two mics. <laughs> You're doing great. Um, building feed maps. Uh, I had... Um, um, because I want a lot of flexibility there and a lot of variation um, and I want that all pre-built before I'm on site because I know exactly the structure of the file getting delivered. I do spend a lot of time in disguise um, building different maps to have prepared so we can call them up right away. Um, and I'm sure there's a way to automate it and uh, we can get really clever about how to do that. <laughs> Another question from Tiffany. What's a good way to market yourself to new clients as a screen producer? Uh, that's a really good question. Yeah, I think it depends on the show. Th this, is, this is the struggle, I think, right now and why it was important me to, to, for me to get this book out is um, you know, these, these shows, I think, need this role. So to market yourself as a screens producer is to, you know, be able to have good relationships with show producers from maybe other events you've worked on to be able to recommend you to say, you come with a process and a workflow that makes rehearsal more efficient and more successful. And my, what's most important to me is I usually leave a show with a lot of recommendations and, um, and support from the content teams because the process we bring has improved their creative experience on a production and they go back and tell the producers that and hopefully that's what translates to your next job. A question from Steven. Thank you. Hi, <clears throat> Steven. Um, I, my question was really about, uh, and this is the first time hearing about your company, but the way you, you kind of framed your company and your style of design around like the video content being scenic as opposed to, you know, something that's more 
like this gentleman said about gaming or music where the content on the screen is almost the forefront. Um, I recently went to a, a concert where they had uh, like a, you know, 3D glasses and it was a full 3D experience with a video, with a, just a flat video wall. But um, I think it's a, certainly a game changer, but I'm, I'm interested to think, see what you think about uh, shows that emphasize the screen as opposed to lay it as a backdrop. Um, well, there are definitely productions and, and live environments where, where it is about the screens. Um, coming from a theatrical environment, screens are just one piece of it. So, you know, I feel strongly that if I'm distracted from the performers on stage, something's gone wrong. But gaming environments, some live production environments, this, the screens are the focal point, and, and that's definitely how it should be for an immersive experience. Um, we could differentiate from video as scenic design to you know, video as the creative motivator for anyone being at a live event, and I think that's a different type of production. Um, because I'm from theater and working in broadcast, to me, the focal point is that close-up shot and supporting, supporting that presence on stage. So th that has been my guiding creative force. Um, but yes, I think there's absolutely a place for those visual experiences uh, to, to be an immersive live entertainment experience. But then it is mostly about the screen or a performer who needs that enhancement to really on a stage. It, you know, it's fascinating too to walk, watch in um, the rock industry, the, the massive amounts of, of screens that get put out. Um, and, you know, the smaller and smaller the band starts to look against all this. Um, I think it's an interesting challenge. Um, some bands, I think, really benefit from that type of immersion experience with the music. And some bands, um, I, I've had a couple of near misses with some old school rock and rollers where at some point a designer was just like, get rid of the screens. This is not what we need to have this musical experience. So it's, it's different for every, every type of show. Uh, we have a question from E.L. Dims. How do you approach educating your client on the time, needs, and costs of a project when most of the time there's not a lot of time, limited budget, and they have the highest demands? Um, we, we suffer like all digital creative industries. Uh, I, I could talk to you about web design. I could talk to you about any kind of graphic design. Um, because our jobs are dependent on a computer, someone we work for is going to think either their nephew could do it or that the computer's doing the work. Um, and and, and that's, that's the real challenge we have is, is I, I use the analogy of like, you know, we all have some understanding of what it takes to cut wood and hammer and nail a table together. But the equivalent table in 3D to build that doesn't hold the same sweat equity for the people we work for. And, and the challenge of getting our clients to understand the hard and difficult work that it takes to achieve the magic we create on stages um, is a constant battle and one we fight all the time. Um, for me, it was the trust I built over the years with a number of producers that I could go to and say, uh, you know, I, my team is going to struggle at this budget with this number of people. We have to build it. And it, it is because of the, that trust and the producers I was working with that I could even get to the point to say, I'm going to play this new role as a screens producer and I'm not going to touch any gear and you're going to let me hire all, this, uh, all these other people to do a job you saw me do by myself last year and this is why. But you know, it's still a challenge because I might have um, a screen environment. I, I calculate on that spreadsheet how many pixels are being rendered for each show or how many pixels are being shown for each show on the screens themselves. So I have some factor of HD or some number of HD worth of pixels that describes the set. And then I can go to the producer and say, okay, last year I was able to cover this entire set with 80% of an HD file. This year it's four times HD worth of pixels. 
I understand my budget's not going to quadruple, but you can understand it may need to go up 25%. I may need another team member. Like, there's some physical component that I'm trying to describe the set to the people I work for to show that it is getting bigger, more complex, and, and more demanding. Um, but it's, it's a fight. It's a real fight. Any other questions in the audience? All right, we have one more uh, online. Any advice that you would give to programmers? Um, any advice I give to programmers who, I'm gonna answer that question a couple of different ways. Any advice who, for programmers who are having too many demands put on them and, and need to build the team, um, it, that's where the relationship with the producer is critical. And that, if you're working for a new producer and you realize in discussion with them that there are too many demands putting on the role or the expectations of a particular project are beyond the scope of what one individual can manage, you, you need to be clear and front and center with this information and what it's going to take to accomplish the job well. Um, I could also answer that question another way. If um, you're learning to build a workflow for yourself as a programmer, my advice to a programmer is buy a book like mine. <laughs> <laughs> All right, any other questions? No more questions online as well? Well, we want to say thank you, Laura, for coming and spending uh, this great uh, evening with us and teaching us all your ways. Um, we're going to be uh, hanging around till about 8 o'clock tonight, so please stick around. I believe we have some uh, food that will be Taco coming. Truck Taco truck on the way. So, I'll say one oh. thought then. Yeah, just one closing thought. Um, I've described the ways I, I perceive this role as a challenge, and I consider this a challenge for all of us in the future. And I really want us all to come together in our different the different roles we play in the video community, in screens production, um, and, and communicate and support each other because I feel like as things get more complex, the more we understand about each other and the roles we play in this industry and the better we can support each other, then we can educate our clients into the complexities of what we do and why we need the tools and budgets we need to do it effectively. And we can only do that if we're talking with each other and building community. So I hope we can do that together. Thank you. Oh, thank you so much. I thought it was hard doing cinema and television, <laughs> uh, budgeting and scheduling until yes. I saw your presentation. <laughs> I'm a SMPTE member, I learned a lot. Oh, wow. And I agree with you about theatrical uh, yeah. space because yeah. I learned to uh, direct at the LACC Theater Academy. Okay. And I direct cinematically, but I direct theatrically because yeah. I use space. And yeah. when you tell an actor exactly where you want them to be in. Space, I feel like, is that, that missing link yeah. that really makes the difference between visual supporting an environment or upstaging it. Yeah. I need you downstage left, uh, so and so playing, yeah. and you know, things like that. It's so precise. Yeah. Thank you very much. Yeah, Enjoy. great to meet you. My pleasure. Yeah. Hi. Stephen, nice to meet you. Um, I just wanted to add on to my question as far as, because like, that's definitely the direction I'm seeing my career going to, is like, where maybe this feels more effective or the concert experience or the like the uh, sort of encapsulated experience. What do you think someone in, in, the, in this field, as a person in the theatrical, scenic, and performance world, well, what, what do you think someone in the other world? Because I don't really have any theater experience. You know? Right. But you want to be in more immersive visuals, or you want to be able to do that, more? Any, anything to do with music? Yeah. That's what I'm yeah. Listen, yeah. Uh, I, right now I'm a video tech at Full Wall. Yeah, okay. And I'm just like, I did a, I studied graphic design at school. Okay. And I, I didn't like advertising at all. Yeah, well, you know, it's one of those things. It's like if your ultimate goal is to do creative visuals and have that be front and center, I mean, there are video artists and your work can be displayed anywhere, but when it comes to live entertainment, I think understanding that balance 
between performer and environment is critical. 